history of Simeon in the Bible is a very interesting backstory. Few people know about this. Here's a man who is only mentioned in the Gospel of Luke and is also mentioned in Luke under Jesus' genealogy. Why is Simeon so important that he is mentioned in the Bible, but only briefly? In the Old Testament, there are about 34 counts of men named Simeon. Are they the same man? These are questions I'll be asking our guest, Father Walter Posichnik. Let's bring Father in now. Father, thank you so much for being on the Eternal Life Plan. I have absolutely loved the emails that you have sent to me, especially the one on the history of Simeon. Can you tell the people of Eternal Life Plan a little bit about yourself? Okay. Um, I am a scientist and a priest. Um, I entered seminary when I was 43. I was ordained a priest when I was 48 for the Arch Eparchy of Philadelphia in the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church. Our eparchy and Arch Eparchy are our Greek words that translate to diocese and archdiocese. Um, so I you know, grew up poor. I first generation Ukrainian from Ukrainian parents and grandparents. Technically, my father was born here the year his mother came over. Um, his father came over uh, about six months earlier because his papers came in. Um, and always grew up in the church, grew up very poor, but was fortunate to go to college, get a good job, have a decent living. Um, God called me to the priesthood as an adult, so I entered, dropped what I was doing, entered the priesthood, and it's short, simple version. Um, if I try to tell you about what I was doing professionally, most people, their eyes roll back in their head. The short description, I, I worked as a chemical engineer for the world's largest ultrasonic cleaning company, um, which is headquartered in Trenton. That's the, the short wow. version. <laughs> So uh, you have quite the background before you became a priest. <laughs> yeah, and two of my hobbies, I really, my brother and I, we were fortunate enough to play ice hockey at Boston University. And um, two of my hobbies are restoring old cars. And I was road racing motorcycles as a hobby. And so my friends go, what? <laughs> <laughs> well, my son would love you then because he he's a motor cycle buff and he would love to race motorcycles but the ones that you know are um motocross motorcycles you know right. though oh my gosh uh well let me ask you this father since we're talking about um simeon why is he so important in the in the uh, context of the bible that he's mentioned because he's only mentioned briefly Right. He is very important for one major reason. He's the first one outside of Jesus' family that says, this is the Messiah. And then he tells even Mary and those around him who Jesus is. And even who Simeon is, most people don't know. And church tradition, and remember, uh, people don't even understand, tradition doesn't mean what we did in the past merely tradition actually from the latin means something that was handed forward so simeon his history actually goes back to about 250 to 290 bc that's right before christ when simeon holds jesus and says now lord you can take me church tradition tells us he was 370 years old and people, no, that's impossible. That doesn't happen since before the time of Noah. But now, did no, you say 351 years old? About church tradition says 370. So oh, add 20. <laughs> yeah, 370 so, years old. So the, the accounts in the Old Testament that talks about Simeon that's a easily could have been him. It could have been, but it's actually a different Simeon as okay. far as, as I'm aware. So the account of Simeon is when 
the Library of Alexandria is built about 297 BC. The king, or call him Pharaoh, of Egypt wants all the books of the known world in the library. So he knows that the Jews have all these books and he wants them, but they need to be in Greek because this library is not for Egyptians, but it's for the international world and Greek is the international language. So he asks the Jews for the books. The Jews choose to send 72 of the most educated scholars on the Greek language, the Hebrew language, and theology, the meaning of the scriptures. That's where we get the word Septuagint, Greek for 70, all the Old Testament books. And that's the work that the apostles knew and the early church. Everything that they used was the Septuagint from Greek. Simeon, being one of those 72, when they get to Egypt, the king wants the most accurate translation possible. So he asks himself first, how do I get this? And he thinks to himself, I'll put all of them together working on one book at a time. And when they agree to everything and finish, we'll go book to book that way. But then he thinks to himself, they're going to hide the important quote unquote secret meanings in the scriptures. How do I prevent that? And he comes up with the idea, I will sequester all of them, one from each other, to work one book at a time. When they finish that book, once all of them are done, they will each read the translation in the court. And if they're accurate and they agree, then I will be content that it's correct. Simeon, when they're doing the prophet Isaiah, comes to the line, how will we know the Savior, the Messiah, has been born? A virgin will give birth. And he says, this can't be right. I got a bad transcript. Someone made a mistake. The angel of the Lord told him, because you don't believe, you are going to live to see it happen. So you can interpret that as a punishment. I tell my parishioners on the feast day of Simeon, Imagine being 90 years old for another you know, 280 years. Consider how old people are treated. Oh, you old fogey, you don't know anything. It's just modern times. It's different today. Imagine all of your aches and pains so that death no longer looks like a punishment, but you get to escape the pain and suffering of this world and go through the door of death and resurrection towards heaven. So Simeon knows, doesn't believe, he knows this is the Messiah. And this is why he's so important, because everyone for those years would have known who he is. The apostles would have known, would have been told these things. Mary, you know, we're told Mary um, is taken in by John. So John is his son. Mary is John, the apostle who Christ loved. And you can imagine that they spoke about these things. That well, when, let me ask you this, Father. When um, Simeon was looking at the scripts um, and he saw that it was written that Mary was a virgin, he was going to change the scripts, wasn't he? And, and the angel stopped him immediately yes yes he was because he didn't believe he thought he had it wrong and in fact the hebrew scribes are so careful not to make a mistake that they even considered if you wrote the letter wrong you had to stop and start the manuscript over so Whoa. For right this is how careful they are so for example if you consider i'm supposed to write an a by going top this way and then top that way then i go back across well if i accidentally go up and down and then across well i wrote the letter wrong therefore it doesn't count i did it wrong i made a mistake i have to erase it or start all over that's how careful the catholic church is with the scriptures so i'll give you that real quick so a question i asked 
uh, I was doing a retreat a few weeks ago. When does the Catholic Church start? So even like just contemplate. See, we could argue when God creates the angels, when God creates Adam and Eve. Is it with Abraham, with Noah? So I'll use the Catholic Church in that sense. Even all these Old Testament saints. And people say, well, we don't call the prophets saints. Um, not technically, but we consider them saints in the church. And this is part of what tradition means. So like um, there's three things we always have to remember are absolutely critical to the church. One is the authoritative magisterial teachings of the church that have never changed. Um, they're from Christ through the apostles to the church fathers. They've been taught through the ages. The second part of the church is tradition. Again, it's what was handed forward to us, not merely, oh, what we used to do in the past. No, it was given to us from Christ through the apostles and the church fathers. And the third part is the Holy Scripture. Um, that the Bible, as the Bible, is, the word Bible is Greek, means the books. The Bible's not codified until uh, late 4th century. By 382, the, what we know is the Bible is codified. Um, the Protestants, under you know, Martin Luther, uh, 15, approximately 1,500 years after Christ, um, He's going, he claims he's going to go to the original Hebrew. But what happens is the Jews don't want the Jews following after Christ, this heretic Christ. So they go through their books and they remove sometimes complete books, sometimes one line from the prophecies that Christ fulfilled. And they do this, some accounts say, between the 7th and 10th century. One account that came across says as early as the 6th century. So when Martin Luther says, I'm going to the original Hebrew, he's actually going to books that were redacted as late as the 6th and 10th century. And the Greek that is used by the church is actually from 250 to 290 BC. Um, so, you know, it's comical. A friend of mine said, uh, a parishioner, to think about that with Martin Luther, scripture is inerrant, so, or scripture alone, but I throw out seven books. We Catholics, we don't have seven extra books. They actually get thrown out by the Protestants claiming they're going to the original Hebrew, while the early church used the Hebrew, which is translated at the time of Simeon the Septuagint, and then all the New Testament books are written in Greek. And just because something's not in the Bible doesn't make it not church. Um, we always have the oral tradition, something that almost no one has ever heard of. Why was Moses on Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights? God carved the Ten Commandments quickly. The church tradition tells us God was dictating to him, letter by letter, the Torah or the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Numbers. And this is one of the reasons, I think it was Pope Pius X, 1909, founded the Pontifical Biblical Commission, because he saw the attack on the character of God through things like evolution, that you could reinterpret six days of creation as other than 24-hour periods. But the early church definitely does not teach that. In fact, St. John Chrysostom, St. Basil the Great, and St. Gregory the Theologian specifically teach against evolution. Literally, specifically. Evolution is not a modern idea. It predates written history. And if you go back to Genesis 1, Lucifer gets Adam and Eve to sin, even though they walk personally with God every day in the calm of the evening. And, the, the, you know, basically Lucifer apes God and copies him any way possible to lead people astray. And the whole topic of evolution, I, we could talk till, till we die and not exhaust it. Um, remember, I, I am a scientist. I could tell you where all the lies are. <laughs> yeah, you have I to, love you have to believe over 150 lies to believe evolution. 
Yeah, well, um, there are there are lots of oh, what do I want to say? Um, you know, I grew up with the Baltimore Catechism, and and um, as an adult, I I I'll be real honest, um, Father. I was not very uh, forthcoming when it came to learning more in my formation. I just thought that if you prayed more, you'd you'd become holier. Well, my entire adult life until <laughs> my near death experience, and after that. Um, uh, up until that point, um, I kind of lived in the world and was out of the church and going through the motions that everybody else goes through. Um, but I didn't really delve into actually learning the faith until I came back to the church. And sadly, I didn't come back to the church until 2008. But I didn't know any of these historical accounts at all. What books would you recommend uh, the viewers to read? Uh, that's hard to say. Uh, a large part of where and how I learned a lot of these things is from other faithful. So Simeon, I first heard about this account from a friend of mine who's Coptic. He was actually my boss. He's a good friend of mine. Um, so he grew up in Cairo. Um, he witnessed Mary on the, the top of the church in Cairo. And if you understand what it's like in a Muslim country, it's essentially illegal as a Christian to leave Egypt. It was a miracle for him and his family to be able to leave. Um, even the fact that the first person who saw Mary was a Muslim taxi driver about 3 a.m. one night. Um, and everyone who came to see her had a miracle happen in their life. He told me um, there were so many people crowded around the church when he was there. There were times his feet weren't touching the ground and he's moving with the crowd. This is how many people in faith came. Um, so I've learned some of these through, again, oral tradition, people saying, but a good thing to do is you know, start with the scriptures, um, read the Bible, read many different translations. Don't stick to just one. One of the things I always advise, if you can find, um, sadly, the condition of the church today um, makes it more difficult. I suggest if you can find a Bible in print before 1958, I tend to trust it more because sadly, um, what I'm seeing just witnesses that Bella Dodd wasn't lying. Um, I am told from people I trust, uh, priests, clergy, um, for example, like I, I studied in our seminary for priesthood at Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. Um, so many of the priests were would say the best English translation is the Douay Reims translation for English. Um, but you can read more than one. There's a man, uh, I don't know anything about his background. His name, I believe, is Rick Myers. But he has a website, and it's e-sword.com. And one of the things that he has on there is you can download uh, many different translations, but it's a tool. You can also buy these as software programs. And what the great advantage on your computer is you can search words or phrases or people and allows you to find things quickly if you're studying a particular topic. The limit with those tools is you have to know the word you're seeking in the translation that you're using. One of the advantages with um, Mr. Meyer's eSword program is one of the choices you'll have, you'll see like maybe King James and the plus sign. What the plus sign means is that he has Strong's numbers attached to it. Uh, I don't remember S Strong's first name. But he was a biblical scholar, and in the Greek translation, he put a number to each word throughout all of the scriptures, Old and New Testament. When you, so if you go to Esau and you go King James Plus, of course, you're not going to have the Catholic books with the King James Version, but you'll have the others. 
And in the Old Testament, when you click on the number, below it will come up in the dictionary, the Hebrew word, the Greek word, and the meanings and how it can be used. So that's a great tool in understanding the translation. Obviously, when you get to the New Testament, there's not going to be any Hebrew word because the entire New Testament is written in Greek. Some of, one of the things that's a huge aid is um, a Bible dictionary. Scott Hahn did a great one, Catholic Bible Dictionary by Scott Hahn. I in have fact, that one, yeah. Um, but even some of the Protestants do a good job. The thing to be aware of with the Protestants, and I have a couple friends who are Protestant, and to get through to them what they're throwing out. Um, the entire gospel of John, Jesus says, I am the bread of life that came down from heaven. If you don't eat my flesh, you don't drink my blood. You have no life in you and you will not get to heaven. So one of my Protestant friends, he's actually um, the husband of the woman who was my fifth grade teacher. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's how long we've known them. So um, she has been a friend of our families ever since my oldest sister had her as a fifth grade teacher. And so I gave him um, two things when I saw him at Christmas time. One was um, the Holy Eucharist, the Lamb of God that Church Militant produced. And I gave him a DVD set from the Colby Center for the Study of Creation, Foundations Restored. My personal opinion of why so many people have fallen away from the faith, and I've seen nothing in my entire life to counter that. I've known since 1984 evolution's a lie as a scientist, mm -hmm. as a chemist. It cannot happen. It's like saying we're going to have an explosion and boom, there's a 747. And the 747 is much more simple than the human body. It just can't happen. Um, Basically, evolution says a ball rolls uphill naturally. Um, and the, that goes against the character of God. No, our sinful nature, God created us for eternity. We were not meant to die. As a consequence of our sin, we now suffer pain, suffering, death. Working in the Garden of Eden, this is how amazing it was before we sinned. If there was an apple tree 60 feet high and Adam wanted the very top apple, all he had to do, please bend over and give me that apple. And the tree would bend over and he could pluck the apple. That's how amazing creation was. And mankind, we messed it up when we sinned. So you could say, oh. we started, we sinned, and God has the new Adam from the new Eve, Mary, and that's how he restores creation. So. And it happens through the cross. We have to follow the cross. And again, so if we don't know the church history, the Bible history, like for example, the Bible came out of the church, not the church from the Bible. And a lot of people just don't get that. Um, real quick, even um, Bishop Fulton Sheen said many, many times, and I disagree a little bit with this opinion, and I'll tell you what it is. There's no one alive who actually hates the Catholic Church, but there are many people alive who hate what they think the Catholic Church is. Sadly, I believe there are people who actually hate the Catholic Church because they're so in love with Lucifer, um, but really they're victims of Lucifer like Adam and Eve. They just don't realize it yet. And I think that's what Bishop Sheen was trying to say. Just real quick, that's, that's why Simeon's so important. He's basically saying in the church, he is God, follow him, you'll get to heaven. Father, I know we didn't talk about this, but I've always been very curious about this, and maybe you have the answer. There are so many years in the Bible where, you know, Jesus isn't mentioned. The lost years of his youth and in his 20s. And there's all kinds of speculation of what Jesus was doing, where he was at. Do you know anything about his lost years? Um, yeah, people consider lost years between 12 and what they assume is the 30. Um, but really, no. And because he wasn't doing his mission of salvation yet. Um, 
So he was being faithful to his parents and living a holy um, Jewish life like any other man would live. So even those around him, you know, just like us, were called to witness uh, to our fellow man. And the greatest way we witness is by living the faith. I think it was St. Francis of Assisi. I don't recall. If I'm wrong about this account being with him, but I think it was him where he says to one of the fellow monks, let's go out and witness to the world. So they go out and they walk around on the streets talking about God and the scriptures and they come back to the monastery. And his brother says, well, when are we going to witness? He says, we just did. So we witness by living the faith, actually applying what Jesus taught. It's just like math. I learned two when two is four. It's not 3.99 or 4.001, it's four. So when I balance my checkbook, two and two is four, two minus two is zero, I'm applying math to my life. And if I apply Jesus' teaching to my life and actually live it, I'll end up in heaven. If I choose not to follow it, I'll end up in hell. And I know I tell my parishioners, um, any good professor, first day of college, even school, they tell us, this is what I'm going to teach you. And basically they say, here's the final exam question, exam questions. Now let's learn these things so that you can learn the material. And the test isn't to try to trick you, it's did I successfully teach you what I was hoping to teach you? And that's essentially what the scriptures are. It's God talking to us and teaching us. In fact, my duty as a priest is to understand what these mean and then convey that message to the people. And that's one of the things like my Protestant friend I mentioned before, I told him, I said, remember, Jesus says, do this in memory of me. What does the word memory mean to the apostles? Not to you, not to me today, because today I would say memory is an act of the intellect. I remember what I did yesterday. Memory to the Jews at the time of Christ means that you make something alive. When you're at the mass and the priest is saying the words of consecration, we are transported across creation to be with Christ and the apostles at that one last supper. We're also transported across time to be in heaven, even though on earth. And that's what memory means. And he said, no, 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 it's just memory. I just remember that Jesus did that. I said, that's not what it meant for Christ and the apostles. And this is part of why, like I say, um, you're going to read lots of books with different opinions, and it's difficult. And even we learn by converting people one-on-one -on -one by learning the truth and relaying it to people. And no matter what I do, I can't force people to believe. I can't believe it for them. All I can do is explain it the best I can that they understand it. And it's up to them to believe. Um, and ultimately, at some point, maybe you have a miracle in your life, like you talk about your encounter, and you no longer believe, you know. The challenge now is in that knowing still to not sin. Yeah, I know God's real. I know there's a heaven. I know there's a hell. I know the devil that Michael Voris is battling, um, you know, by hearing different people talk about different things. And um, like, so the point is, especially as a priest, even as lay Catholics, when you know what you're battling, you have power over it. In fact, a fascinating thing to listen to, and I recommend any of your viewers who want to, you want to hear the second most powerful devil in hell cry? Um, there is a exorcist by the name of Peter Glass. He's Polish. And he has, uh, there is a YouTube video out called The Demons of Sex. I think it's pronounced Demanu Sexu in Polish. And in it, he's talking about, of course, it's tr um, translated subtitles in English. And he has at times recordings of an exorcism that he's doing. 
The second most powerful devil in hell behind Lucifer is Baal or Baal. So who is Baal or Baal? When you watch the Ten Commandments and Charlton Heston playing Moses is coming down the mountain and they're making the golden calf, they're not just making a random calf. That's Baal or Baal. Um, he inclines people to fornication. And that's um, the second most powerful devil in hell. And he's crying because the exorcist is at the point where he must reveal his name to the exorcist. And why is he crying like a two-year-old child? Because the next thing is he's going to be commanded to go to the foot of the cross of Christ, receive his sentence, and he knows it's go back to hell where all the other devils are going to torment him. And he's crying because he doesn't want the torment, but at the same time, he refuses to repent from anything he's done. Father, this is, this is a kind of power we have over the devils. People just don't, the church hasn't taught it. So real quick for you, part of why well, we're let here. Me, let me ask you this before you move on. Okay. Um, the, the souls that are condemned to hell, uh, do they become do they become demons and and are assigned by Lucifer to go and torment other souls or are they just in uh, eternal damnation and are they're just they're burning they they can but only if God permits it oh okay. so they're okay. so the point is like for um like someone who has died, where is their soul? That's the that's what purgatory is about. Those who will inherit heaven, but they have some stain left on their soul. Pergamentum place, purgatory place of cleansing. Those last little stains are being washed off them, so they're free to enter heaven on judgment day. Those who are inheriting hell. There's questions. Where can they be? Where are they? They can only be where God permits them to be, but the soul doesn't cease to exist, even though the body is in the ground somewhere. Many people don't even know, sadly, in the church, and this is what I was going to say before, was um, St. John Henry Newman in 1912 said, it's sad the condition or the state of catechesis in the church today. And that's 112 years ago. And Today, it's horrible. Very few people seem to know anything. Um, but you, the de demons actually have power if they're permitted. And we only permit them by saying yes to them and no to God. Um, but you think, in fact, consider the words of Jesus. The gates of hell cannot prevail against you. So in battle, in war, what are gates for? They're a defensive armament. So Jesus is telling us if we're holy and faithful to him, we can go into hell, knock the gates down, defeat the demons, and leave triumphant. But we have to acknowledge and strive for holiness. And the biggest way you take power away from devils is don't listen to them. And it's, yeah, it's very hard to do. It's difficult. Well, and I think so many times people have trouble distinguishing what's their thoughts and what's thoughts that are being prompted by um, the demonic or, you know, I, and, and it's simple. If you are thinking horrible thoughts, that's not coming from God by any means. <laughs> right. And yeah, I can tell you, I have... Um... I've had that question from many people and even some parishioners. And even they ask, at what point is it my sin? And I said, you know if it's coming from you because you think I would like to do this or I want to do that. So you know if the bad thought's coming from you or not. If the thought just comes to you, you know it by its fruit. If it's good, Feasibly, it's a devil because the devils can lead us astray, but usually it's not. But if it's tempting you to do something bad, absolutely it's from a demon. Um, in fact, one of the very simple things people need to understand and do is prayer is conversation with God. Mm -hmm. So when you're done speaking, 
sit in silence and give the Holy Spirit and your guardian angel time to answer you. In fact, one of the things I've recommended to people for decades, so even before I recognize being called to the priesthood, at least during Lent, when you're driving to work, leave your car radio off. Don't answer your cell phone. When you come home, don't even watch the news. Don't watch as little television as possible. Live in contemplation. Um, let your Holy Spirit, let the Holy Spirit and your guardian angel guide you to truth. Read from the scriptures. There's an old uh, tradition that the at least the Hasidic Jews still practice. The book of Psalms is divided into 30 parts, one part for each day. And every day they read that part of Psalms. And when they get to the end of the month, they start over again. And even though you're reading the same words, you're not the same person today you were yesterday. You don't have the same problems, the same joys. And even though it's the same words, the depth of those words that God inspired David will speak to you and help to guide you. But if we never pray, if we never do that, um, it's like standing on a mountain covered in ice. If I put no effort in, I backslide into hell. Standing still is moving backwards. And that's just a simple part of the catechism of the church through its tradition. And it, it's sad how many people don't know that. We have to put effort into striving for heaven. And I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, I, I, uh, my, my, my day job, so to speak, <laughs> I, I have a sales coach and training business and I, um, do a lot of training women that are incarcerated, training them how to have skills so that when they're going to be released, they'll be able to acclimate into, uh, society, uh, and be successful in life. And um, one of the things that I always do throughout the day, Father, is I sit, I mean, I work in silence, even though I live alone, I, you know, I work out of my house, I sit in silence all day long working, because, you know, having background noise on or having music on, I can't hear God. <laughs> I can't hear my guardian angel go, put that cookie down. <laughs> you, you, in my opinion, you think better also. Yes, it, you do. You do so, think better. <laughs> yeah, I, for, I forget what, who I heard it from, if it was a comedian, but just back way back in the 80s, it's, you know, before all of these um, devices to tell people where to go, how to find where you're going to, when you're getting close, or you think you're lost, what's the first thing people did? Just turn the radio off. If you had children, how many times heard my father? Be quiet, I can't think. Right. <laughs> and, exactly. and if we weren't, and yeah, so, or help me look for this. Yeah, and if everyone's talking, you can't think. In fact, I read a, a short article years ago, and it said, having more than three children in a car is as bad as driving drunk. And I said, that's crazy. That's, that, that makes no sense. And friends of mine asked me to watch their four children for them while they were away somewhere. And they were like, hey, can we go get an ice cream? So, okay, so we get in the car. I almost blew the second stop sign we came to because they're talking and all excited and half arguing. And I know the stop sign's there and I'm looking at it. I'm like, will you be quiet? And I almost ran the stop sign. I'm like, I guess the article was right. It's worse than being <laughs> drunk <laughs> because my attention wasn't all on driving. Yeah, that's a cute story. And it's so true, too. It's so true. Well, and Father, this is, um, and this is what the devils like to do. It's just, if nothing else, just distract. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, have we hit on everything? Everything except I'd like to close on something very positive. Thank you. So many people don't know. They know that Jesus taught this. He says, if you have faith the side of a mustard seed, you can tell it, move from here to there, and it will. 
So almost no one knows this, but the Copts, they know it. Um, Copt is the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphic word that means Christian. And that's um, spelled C-O-P-T, correct? Yes. Okay. So um, this miracle happened about the year 870 in the year of our Lord. And even some people speculate, well, why doesn't the whole church know it? Why don't they know specifically the year? And some of the cops writing about this, they say, well, when it happened, probably everyone knew and everyone's thinking, no one's ever going to forget. So the specific date that it happened isn't recorded, but they know under the kingship. So they can ascribe it to, with greatest likelihood, the year 870. And what is the event that led up to it was uh, the Muslim caliph of Egypt did not like the Christians and he wanted to kill all the Christians and destroy all the churches. So this is, you know, all the Catholics, this is before the Great Schism. So still the Catholic Church is one in the world historically. One of his highest ranking inner court members was Jewish pretended to be Muslim so that he could have power in the government. He also hated the Christians and he was trying to figure out how to destroy the church. And he found in the scriptures where Jesus says, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can tell the mountain, move from here to there and it will. So he goes to the king and says, look, this is in their scriptures. Go to the Pope in Alexandria, and command him to make the miracle happen. If it doesn't happen, their God is fake and have them agree that you'll burn all the churches and you'll kill all the, the Catholics, basically the Christians. So he go, the king goes to the Pope the next morning and says to him, you believe in everything that's in the Bible? He says, yes. So he opens it and he points to that line. He commands him, you will make that miracle happen 30 days from now, or I will burn all the churches and kill all you Christians in all of Egypt. And he leaves. The Pope is so upset, he doesn't know what to do. And so he goes, as soon as the meeting's over, he goes across to the chapel, talks with the other priests, and bishops tells him what happened. And they, one of them says, well, at least these first three days, we will all pray to God that he inspire us what to do that night the pope the angel of the lord visits him and tells him in the morning when you go into the city square at the fountain you will see a man with one eye carrying a pitcher follow him and do whatever he tells you to do that man's name is samaan translates to simon he's known as saint samaan the tanner that same night, the angel Lord tells St. Simon, Samaan, the Pope's going to come to you tomorrow and ask you a question. You know what to guide him with, instruct him. Um, so the angel Lord had told the Pope, he's the holiest man in all of Egypt. Um, that's why he was sending, the angel was sending him to St. Samaan. So the following morning, the Pope goes into the city square, sees the man. He follows him back to his little back alley, little shop in one little tiny part of Cairo, tells him what happened. And Samaan says, who am I to guide you? You're the Pope. And the Pope says, the angel told me to ask you, you would guide us to the correct teaching. He says, OK, I will humbly do what he said. Here's what we need to do. We will have many masses throughout the whole country for the miracle to happen. And everyone will fast for these next 30 days for this miracle. On the day that the miracles commanded by the Khalif, we will all gather, have a mass. And after the mass, we'll pray to God for the miracle. So they gather along the Nile River. They have a mass. Of course, all the Muslims can't be at the mass, they finish the mass, they kneel down and ask God for the miracle. They finish praying, they stand up and the mountain in the distance rises up. They could see the rising sun under the mountain. They kneel back down, the mountain settles. They stand up again, 
the mountain rises. They start to walk to the mountain. The mountain moves away from them as fast as they are walking. They start to run to the mountain and it moves as fast as they're running. The caliph gets so scared and all of the rest of Egypt, he says, enough, enough, enough. Your God's the real God, make it stop. So you can imagine, of course, the fear is because a mountain moving doesn't happen without any sound or noise and the entire earth is shaking. So they kneel down to thank God for the miracle and they stand up and the mountain doesn't move. If the whole church, this is what Father Chad Ripperger talks about, how tough it is today to cast out demons is because of the lack of the holiness of the church. The whole church needs to be holy, needs to be fasting and praying that God inspire us and lead all of us and that we all live that holy life and witness to each other. This is you know, one of the reasons why you know, I, I found you online um, partly is, you know, Praying for Michael Boris and what's going on with him. Praying for church militant. Um, people ask, some people ask me, what should I do? And I, you know, if you want to do anything, write to the board and say, how can I pray for you and help you if you won't tell me what's going on with you? Um, some people have attacked Michael and the board um, and said, you're acting just like the bishops. Well, act like Christ tells us to. Lay everything out. Tell me exactly how many people are, you know, subscribing for a month, for a year. Who's giving big amounts of donation? Let us know your state of health. Um, and the biggest thing, of course, is none of this happens without prayer and fasting. Um, part of, I'll tell you one, what I did several years ago, um, under, like for St. Gint, uh, St. John Henry Newman, the lack of catechesis. Why did church militants start? Why did Michael start all of this? Because the Dan Brown, Da Vinci Code movie came out mm -hmm. and he couldn't talk theology to any Catholics. He said, there's this heresy, but no one knows. So he started with the One True Faith, one hour um, TV show to catechize the people just so they could know, like, like you say, what's your plan? Well, how can I make a plan if I don't know where I'm going? Um, so for my parishioners one year, I got each person a one-year subscription, and I told them specifically, watch every episode of The One True Faith, and if you have time, watch each episode of Armor of God. Half of my parishioners didn't take me up on it. Mm. Um, Simon Rafey actually emailed me back, Here's a whole bunch of unused codes. What do you want to do? So I'm giving those codes to the people who used it. One of the prisoners who used it told me it changed my life because he's learning the catechism that priests and bishops should be teaching people. And part of what I question even is who's teaching and not teaching what? So I spent five years in seminary and I fully believe that part of formation used to be If a person has a particular sin, here's the saint to pray for intercession. Just like a doctor, you have a, you don't take an aspirin um, if you chop the finger off. No, you go, you get it sewn up. Or there's a certain medicine for a certain illness, and that was I would not taught that at all in seminary. I can't claim that it was, but I certainly believe it. The Catholic Church, through near you know, about 2,000 years of existence, has learned the names of devils and what works and doesn't work. Um, you know, one of the things that people need help with their faith, I suggest um, look up on YouTube Zachary King from Satanist to Catholic. Um, I believe Zachary King's my age, about 58, based on what he says about his story. He was basically the equivalent of the Pope of Rome to Lucifer, and he became Catholic. So if you search that video, it's almost two hour long, and he talks about how he fell into it and how he became Catholic. And you know, one of the most amazing parts, just to think, it's one of those videos to watch many times. A Catholic woman came, he was, at this time, he had left Satanism, um, and he had to escape. They, yeah, the Satanists would have murdered him. So he had to 
he had to basically escape from where he was living. So he had, at this time, he's working in a mall at a jewelry store. Woman came, comes in, lights something, says, oh, but I'll come back. And she leaves to go to another store. He says, right, everyone says that they don't come back. But she did come back. And she, and she gave him a miraculous medal. And she put in his hand. And he says in the interview, because it was real, I looked at it. It was cheap silver metal. I was prepared to throw it to the ground. But the moment she put it in my hand, the entire store disappeared. I was afraid to let go for where I might fall to. And so this is, this is part of, he talks about, as a Satanist, he knew what things had, what prayers said over it. Because the devils, the demons, would let them know. And sadly, we as Catholics don't know, you know, what saints to pray for. So like even these last three years, real quick, with the, the total fear of COVID-19, one of my faithful friends um, in the Colby Center for Creation said, you know, Saint, Saint Benedict, among other things, protects against infectious diseases. So I got a St. Benedict medal for all of my parishioners and blessed it for them. Yeah, and many people never got sick. Um, that's a whole other story. But you know, it's, my point is the lack of catechesis is so sad. And we can never forget to pray and fast constantly. Well, the other part of it too, Father, is, you know, there used to be a spirituality that um, surrounded Catholicism, the, the mysticism of Catholicism. And I don't think people even believe in the spiritual side anymore. You know, when I talk about that, I constantly talk to my guardian angel during the day or um, St. Padre Pio or talking to God or talking to Jesus or the Blessed Virgin Mary, they have forgotten or never knew that there was that side to it all too. You know, and of course, this became evident to me in my near-death experience, how real it really is and how temporary this world is. The real life isn't here. The real life is on the other side. That's, that's true. And what many people... To add with that, what many people don't grasp is your body matters. One of the things that burns me up, literally, and I say that on purpose to be poetic, is cremation's a sin. Always has been, always will be. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. When you're baptized and chrismated, the Holy Spirit in Christ lives in you. Every time you receive Holy Communion, literally the body and blood of Christ mm -hmm. is in you. Wherever you walk, the light of Christ goes. The devils in the world see it and they know it, even though we can't see it. Um, in fact, one account of one priest who was doubting, a uh, Roman Catholic priest, I don't recall all the details, but he came into the church late one night and didn't turn the lights on. He knew his way around the altar and he saw all these light spots all around the altar and the floor it was the holy communion it was the the light of christ in communion and something oh, i wish i had that miracle happen to me well he needed that because he was doubting or wasn't believing mm -hmm. a, a statistic that's really scary that's troublesome is less than 25 percent of church going catholics believe that they're receiving the body and blood of christ this is the medicine that cures your body, cures your soul, mm -hmm. forgives sins, and conquers death. And how many priests and bishops don't appear to believe? Yes. The, the fact that I can even say that, I don't want to say that, but it, it looks right. that way. St. John Chrysostom, he had millions of people dying around him and the church fathers. You think you're going to die tomorrow? you get your backside in the confessional you make a good confession you do the penance the medicine it's not a punishment it's a medicine that you need 
to conquer your sins, you receive the prayer of absolution, that's Latin for untying from the devil, and then you receive the body and blood of Christ. And now that you're in a state of grace, stay that way so that when you die, you're free to go to heaven. Because at the end of time, your soul will be reunited with your finished body. That's what perfect means. And then your entire body and soul as composite body goes to heaven. That's one of the things that makes us higher than the angels. Angels are spirit alone. We're body and spirit. So like, Father, even, let, like me, for, for, let me think just to answer one more question. Go back I'm, to one question you asked. What to read? Um, online is a great source called the Summa Theologica, work of oh, Thomas, yeah. Aquinas, Thomas right. Aquinas. You you have any question on anything? Type in your question and Saint Thomas Aquinas or Summa Theologica, and it will come up. And anywhere where you hear. Um, the prophet says that's generally Elijah is the prophet. And when you read the philosopher, that's Aristotle. So like even all of the commandments of God, you can reason to from human existence through philosophy. Um, so like Bishop Fulton Sheen said, you can reason to an existence of God, but you can only know him by getting on your knees in prayer. And God answers prayers, not necessarily the way we want it and how we want it. I remember an account, this is a true story. This man, when he was a child, went to the fishing pole and they were poor. And he prayed fervently for a fishing pole, never got it. When he became an adult, he ended up having his own sports store. And what does he have? Millions of fishing poles that he's selling to people. So, yeah, God answered his prayers, but not necessarily the way he thought. He had to make his own fishing pole out of a branch and a string. So God gave him a fishing pole, but he gave him the ability to work. So virtue requires effort. Sin is easy. And the devil wants us to choose the easy way to help. Well, let me ask you this question that um, I've never found a good answer for. Are we spirit and soul or are we just a soul? And the reason why I ask that is because in my near-death experience, I knew I was myself. It was my own personality. I had my memories. I still had my same thoughts. Um, but there was, the, but I also knew that I didn't have my human body, but I did seem to have another body. Right. Does that make sense? Yes. Spirit and soul are essentially synonyms. So when, so uh, yeah, a spirit, so our soul is the, so we use the word soul from philosophy. Spirit is generally from um, scriptures, from God's revelation to us. So a spirit is an incorporeal being. It's a being without body. So when I die, my soul, my spirit leaves my body. So I'm now pure spirit. But God intended for me to be a composite creature, body and spirit or soul. And so in the, the Greek philosophers, even in India, the soul was thought to be the part of a living creature that imparted motion on the being. So they would argue animals have a soul. A cat has the soul of a cat, the dog a soul of a cat. Some of the Greek philosophers said even a rock had a soul. It had the soul of a rock. The Catholic Church would say the rock exists because God holds it in existence. And mm -hmm. that's the same kind of way of. So do cats and dogs um, have souls? You know, that's a question that some people say yes, some say no. Um, but consider a loving God. Why would God create a creature just to uncreate it? He wouldn't. It doesn't make sense. In fact, all the animals, all creation, the whole universe, ages and dies and goes through what it does because of our sins the animals were meant to be eternal too a fascinating uh, experiment a japanese botanist did was he considered what he thought the uh, the environment on the earth would have been like at the time of adam and eve and he recreated that in a giant greenhouse and he grew a tomato plant and after two years the tomato plant was bigger than a tree 
40 or 50 feet high is, is wide as the space would allow, had produced tons and tons and tons of tomatoes. Yeah, that the tomato plant dies because of the, uh, the cycles of the seasons. It just, it's just a, it's an, it's a glimpse into reality. Um, uh -huh. One of the things I've, I do with my parishes, do a uh, movie day on the Sunday. One of the first movies, <laughs> it wasn't a movie, it was a documentary called, um, it was originally done, I think, 1990, Wolves at Our Door. And um, I forget what it's called now. It's now like an hour and a half long. But to watch the documentary about once the, it took like three generations of wolves before the wolves would accept um, the man as part of their pack and just live a normal life. He had fenced in, I think it was 50 acres in Idaho. Yeah, the wolf pack's a family unit. And in watching the documentary, they behave more virtuously than the best human family I know. Literally, wow. because a wolf, an animal, um, doesn't sin. It lives its animal life as God meant it to. We have the belief to say no to God. In fact, um, that's one of the episodes of Michael Vohr. I forget one of the um, one true faith. Freedom isn't about the freedom to do whatever you want. The church calls that freedom of indifference. Freedom is the freedom to choose the good. It's called, the church calls it freedom of virtue. Law doesn't limit you. Law frees you. So think mm -hmm. of something as basic as the speed limit on the street. In fact, in philosophy, to judge if any act is good or bad, you only need to go through three steps. What if everybody does that act and only that act? Where does that lead to? And is that end good or evil? If it's good, then the act is moral. If it's evil, then the act is immoral. So like driving the, in the city here, the some of the streets are 25 miles an hour because if they're narrow, it's tight, you can't see. Well, I say, oh, it's a human law. My car will do 160. I'm going to do 160. Well, if everyone said, no, next person said, I'm going to do 70. I'm going to do 25. Well, when I come to the stop sign, I look left and right. If I start going through and it's me coming at 160, I'm going to get creamed and killed. You, ne you never know what to expect. So that leads to total chaos. Obviously, total chaos and people dying is evil. Therefore, the original act is evil. Therefore, it's not merely a human law, but a good law. So who does the speed limit free? The entire community to live well together. You know what to expect one to other. And that's what God's commandments are about to live in um, eternity with God because his laws free us. I, I know I tell some of the young children, um, you know, what heaven might be like. I said, if I tell you not to put your feet up on the table and you keep doing that, what do you think I'm going to do to you? I'm going to throw you out. Why do you think God's going to let you put your feet up on his table when he tells you not to? It's really that simple. And, you know, so, and even the difference between believing and knowing. And like I said earlier, um, I believe a lot of people don't believe in God anymore because you're being told constantly in society, in the schools, on the television, every program, evolution's true. Therefore, you're here by accident. Therefore, there's no God. And the devil knows that's the natural progression of that thinking. So once they think that, oh, well, there's no God. And they just don't think and they don't want to conceptualize mm -hmm. it. So fascinatingly with that, uh, Ben Stein made a movie called Expelled No Intelligence Allowed um, around 2004, 2005. That's the time intelligence design was being taught and um, or people are discussing it not too far from me, south in York, PA. School district was discussing it and the mainstream media horde just bombarded them nationally and we're calling the people crazy. So Ben Stein at the end of the movie has his interview with Richard Dawkins, the world's greatest evolutionist today, um, an avowed God hater. And Ben Stein calmly asks him, well, how did it begin? He says, well, intelligent life from out there seeded life on earth. 
and Ben Stein does the sound, which like you and I will know children won't. It's the record needle <laughs> across the record. Says, what? Hold on. Richard Dawkins thinks intelligent design is worthy of study. And that's the whole point. How did we begin? There has, and this is Aristotle's unmoved mover. So this is philosophy, like Bishop Holton Sheen says. Aristotle says, if all motion happens because something else pushes it into motion, it doesn't make sense. That goes on infinitely. At some point, you have to come to the first motion pushed into motion by an unmoved mover. And the church calls that the philosopher God. So even consider Moses on Mount Sinai. Um, to ask God his name is to ask for God's power. So like today, if you have to go to court, you get a letter in the mail, you, you must show up. Well, pre-written days um, when most people don't read, the knight or a soldier came, knocked on your door, the king demands you in his court, you're coming with me. I come in the name of the king. So Moses says to God, well, if I go to them, they're going to say, okay, if you met God, then what's God's name? God tells Moses a philosopher name. I am who am. In other words, I exist. And Jesus' name in Greek, Emmanuel, is I am who am with us. So God so loves us, he walks the earth just like us. So he can show us how to get to heaven. And on judgment day, no one can give him the excuse. Well, you don't know what it's like because you're not human. No, he died on the cross for us. So yes. he, he knows exactly what it's like. He knows what we need. But if we never ask for his help, we never ask our guardian angel for help, we're not going to get it. That's right, Father. Thank you so much. Well, um, this has been a fascinating discussion. I just want you to know how much I appreciate you coming on and i learned so much from your emails that you send me i so appreciate it and i do hope you come back but before we end um father could you um bless us all and folks let's remember what father said we need to keep church militant and michael vores in our prayer so father could you give us a blessing please absolutely May our Lord and God and Savior Jesus Christ, through his everlasting kindness and mercy and love for mankind, grant you many happy years, peace, health, wisdom, and truth, and salvation in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank Go you forth. so much, You're Father. Welcome. You're welcome. Go forth in peace. Thank you. You're welcome. And if you'll just hold on for a second, I'll conclude and then I'll come back to you, okay? Okay. All right, everyone. I so hope you enjoyed Father and all the history that he imparted on us and his wisdom. And we'll have him back because I was fascinated with him too. But in conclusion, remember, eternal life is forever. Got a plan. Bye-bye. God bless.